Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Tonight I want to talk about forgiveness. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 32, you're going to open the Amplified Bible. He says, and we should become useful. Are you hearing? and helpful and kind to one another tender-hearted that is compassionate understanding and loving-hearted compassionate understanding and loving-hearted compassionate understanding and loving-hearted compassionate i repeat understanding and loving-hearted and it says, forgiving one another readily and freely. Underline that. As God in Christ forgave you. Somebody say, Amen. It says, forgiving one another readily and freely. I want you to underline the readily and freely. Readily and freely. In other words, you have to be ready, one, to forgive and free to forgive. What do I mean by readiness of forgiving? It means you have to fine-tune yourself, right, to agree with your nature of God. Because God is love, and you are born of God, and you are born again. And because you're born again, you're born of God. And because you are born of God, it is your nature, right, to forgive. And therefore, you should live with humankind human beings you should live with men with a readiness to forgive you must always keep the excuse that men are susceptible to sin to offend to wrong you to hurt you to cut you to go the way against your expectations you must understand that but that you must carry the readiness to forgive that makes more sense when you get married. <laughs> I tell people, if you are married and you enter marriage without the readiness to forgive, you can't keep your marriage. Not because people are bad, but because you will put your eye on the minor and put your eyes off the major. Who has understood what I just said? So for me, when I was going to get married, I told myself that I have forgiven in advance for anything that you'll ever do. So do whatever you want, but me in my head, I've forgiven you. You understand what I'm saying? It is the only way you can live a happy life. Somebody said amen. That's why I tell couples, when you're entering marriage, Enter when you have forgiven. Don't enter to forgive. Enter when you have what? You'll enjoy marriage. You'll enjoy it. Hallelujah. Because you enter when you are forgiven. It's not a matter of what they will do. It's a matter of what you, you already... I tell people when you configure your mind and tune it to forgive, you put it in forgive mode. Hallelujah. So that regardless of what your spouse does, it's a pre-configured setting in your system. To change it, you'll have to have a factory reset, which is not possible in the new bar. Hallelujah. But you must carry a readiness. And I ask why? Because you're born of God. It's the only proof that you were born again. Hallelujah. Is the only proof that you are born of God. The only proof that you are born of God is that you have already a pre-configured setting in you 
of readiness to forgive. You're ready to forgive. So I don't deal with human beings with too much expectation. No, because I know they are flesh. There's a part of you that is flesh. You have a treasure, but they're nothing vessels. I hope the best in them. But if they go short, I understand they're human beings. Even God says, I will not strive with man for long, for he is flesh. He is flesh. Even God said, no, 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 I can't fight with man forever. This man is flesh. He's flesh. When you get the God kind of love, when it gets into your head, you realize that you can't. You can't. But you must have a readiness in your spirit to forgive. You understand? I'm your pastor. But I know any of you can hurt me or harm me or do something wrong to me. I must have a readiness in my spirit to forgive you. Are you hearing me? And if I offend you on the pulpit also, you must have a readiness to forgive me. You know, we have people who look through someone and say, I think he's talking about me, even when I'm not talking about you. You understand what I'm saying? But there's a way Satan has a way of telling people things they're not supposed to hear. Praise God. And so when you carry that readiness, that's one of the first things that tell you that you are on the steady path of forgiveness, walking in forgiveness. You have a readiness. You have a readiness. You can be hurt by someone, but you have a readiness to forgive. Someone should not come to you and say, I'm sorry. And you say, but why did... No, eh, 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 eh. The first thing you do is, I forgive you. The first thing you say is what? I forgive you. I don't use, if you've been around me for long, you realize I never use the word I forgive you. I don't use that language. My language always is I forgive. Because I have configured my head to forgive. Quick to forgive. Quick to forgive. Quick to forgive. Quick to forgive. Hallelujah. Quick to what? To forgive and quick to repent. Quick, 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 quick. Are you hearing? Because I need to live a good life. Praise the Lord. And so I tell people, you must carry a readiness to forgive. But also, you must be free to forgive. Meaning, forgiveness is a liberty. Forgiveness is a liberty. Somebody shout amen. Forgiveness is a what? It's a liberty. If you are not forgiving, then you are bound. You're bound to that thing, you're bound to that individual, you're bound to their consequences. And as long as you don't forgive, their consequences will always live around you. I always tell people, to walk in unforgiveness is to walk in bondage of another. It is to walk in the bondage of another. One time I was uh, praying for a lady who had entered a marriage with a man and this man did something to her life that was according to science, permanently damaging, okay? And so she came, oh, apostle, I kept my vows. She was depressed. I kept my vows and I did what was right and then this man damaged this and that and that and that, and, you know? But before it all, before even the narration, she had come for healing. In fact, her mind originally was to come for healing. And that was the point of healing. But in my spirit, the Lord spoke to me and said she will not heal because she's angry with her husband and so when I asked the story that's when she narrates I kept my vows and I did all this stuff and then he did this and then now I'm damaged forever that was the first time I ever heard God say the word that I had that day in my ears that when a man walks in unforgiveness you keep the consequence for which you are offended, for which you are hurt, for which you are crossed, for which you are inflicted of. You keep it. And that's the freedom to let go. And the Lord told me, if she cannot forgive, she cannot walk free. She cannot walk free. She will not heal in her body because she's dealing with unforgiveness. And so a woman carried a disease in her body for so long years because her heart had refused to let go of whoever gave her that disease. 
and this is the freedom we're talking about. I tell people, never let another man's evil consume you enough to be evil. Never let another man's evil consume you enough to be evil. And some people have paid back with the same degree of anger, the same anger that was exerted to them. Because with them that is the satisfaction. But they do not know that that was bondage. Why? Because you're so bound by another man's weakness that you have become like them. Or even worse. That's why I tell people vengeance is of the what? Is of the Lord. Hallelujah. So for you to walk in freedom, to be free. There are people who say, I'm ready to forgive, but I'm not free. I'm ready to forgive, but there's something in me that just doesn't have the freedom to do that. And I'm telling you, you have to be both ready and free. And how do you walk in the freedom to let go? Is by understanding that if you let go, no consequence has a vote on your future. But if you don't let go, those consequences have a say on your future. So you choose whether you want to begin another future of faith or you want to stay in the past of unforgiveness. Are you hearing me? It is freedom to forgive. Never forget that. When a man cannot forgive, no matter how bad, sometimes you never know how bad you're bound until your heart. In the words of the late Nelson Mandela, that great man, he said that we fight for the freedom of the oppressed as we fight for the freedom of the oppressor. Because the oppressed is evidently in chains. But the oppressor also has his own bondage. Because what in the head tells him to oppress a man like that? What in the head tells him to arrest a man for 27 years in prison on Robben Island? Because he said that we are equal. We are equal. He just said we are one, we are equal, we are human beings, we have hearts, we have blood like you, we have the organs every human being has and we have a brain too, we are equal. And they arrest that man for 27 years of his life, they were taken off him. Because the man said we are equal. So Mandela was saying, yes I was oppressed, but they were more oppressed and in bondage because the bondage was of their mind. And that's how human beings are. Some of us forget that the carnal nature is a fallen nature. And men in their carnality can be something else. Fences on your homes are not made for wild animals. No. Electricity over your fences is not made for wild animals. Alarms are not made for wild animals. Padlocks are not made for wild animals. No. Vaults are not built for wild animals. Guns are not made for wild animals. Atomic bombs were not made for wild animals. Nuclear weapons were not made for wild animals. They were made for men, by men. This is how dangerous human beings can be. Are you hearing me? A man under an idea can be tutored and taught for months and is convinced and he gets eight bombs strapped on his chest and he enters hundreds of innocent people and pulls that thing and kills them all. <clears throat> In the name of religion and faith. They can convince a man to get to that level. And somewhere in his head there is a God who is going to reward him for what he has done. But sometimes even religion has taken away common sense. In fact, the first religion should be to be human. To just know that you're a human being. To know that you're dealing with life. You understand what I'm saying? A young man was born and raised with siblings and love around them and they were loved and given everything they ever dreamed of. They suckled the woman's breast and then tomorrow they sit in a plane 
direct it toward the building. And in there are families, innocent mothers, innocent people, innocent families. The native African who flew 10,000 miles away is the only sole breadwinner of his own family and the whole tribe and is the hope for hundreds of people back home and is walking through that same building. And another girl is walking in the same building. She has just graduated at home. And her parents are excited. And they're telling her, we're taking you for lunch. But she then she has dropped through to see her brother. And there is an old lady there. There is a beloved mother there. There is a son there. There is a black, white, Hispanic. They're all in there. And there is a Muslim too there. Are you hearing me? And then he gets his plane and directs it into a building and kills people. And he is even ready to die with them. And if you check his brain, he's normal. He's normal. He's not mad, he's not maniac, he's not depressed, he's nothing. He's just an ideology. Entered a man and he looked at normal human beings as something else from the image God created them to be. And they say that that is our faith. That's how human beings are. You're not in prison because you've done the best stuff. No. You're in prison because God has preserved you from harming men. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? There is no difference between the men seated in this room. It's in the flesh. It's in the carnal nature of any man to have the ability to do anything the worst prisoner in the world has done. Yes, even with your good-looking face, you can be deadly and wicked except the grace of God and the life of Jesus Christ coming in you. Otherwise, all of us, if it was not for God, we would be far. Somebody shout hallelujah. So he says, forgive freely and readily, even as God in Christ forgave you. Hallelujah. And so we say, well, then how does God forgive? If you say God in Christ forgave us, how does God forgive? Because he's saying we are supposed to forgive even as God has forgiven. Even as God has forgiven us in Christ. So how does God forgive? You must understand the God kind of forgiveness and the worldly kind of forgiveness are you following me isaiah chapter 43 verses 25 the amplified isaiah 43 verses 25 he says even i he says am he who blots out and cancels your transgressions comma for my own sake comma and i will not remember your sins hallelujah now he has said, I blot out, I cancel your transgressions. I blot out, I blot out, and I cancel, comma. But I love that God said, for your own sake. That means forgiveness is for you more than it is for the one who receives forgiveness. Forgiveness benefits the forgiver more than the forgiven. Hallelujah. That is, that is why I gave the example of the lady and I said, this forgiveness was going to bring her healing. We are not sure whether the other one will be, but we were sure that forgiveness was going to heal her. So even to God, even to God, he says, look, my forgiveness for you benefits me. Why? Because I keep my relationship with you. It might not be important for you to keep your relationship with me, but I am God and it's in my nature to forgive. So it benefits me in the nature that I carry to forgive you. Hallelujah. Oh yeah, 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 I don't need God. You can say that. But God has never said that I don't need you. He will always need you. He will always love you. Not as one who really needs you, but as one who by nature has or should need you because it's his nature to love you unconditionally. Somebody shout hallelujah. So forgiveness helps the forgiver more than the forgiven. It benefits the forgiver more than the forgiven. It's for your sake that you forgive someone. It's for your sake that you let go of someone. It's for your sake that you extend love to the one who has hurt you. It's for your sake. It's for your 
sake. God said, for my own sake. Always understand. You know, there are people who say, no, 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 no. Yes, but I can't let this person just go away free. Who told you they're free? Because you've forgiven them. Who told you they're free because you've forgiven them? You have a wrong understanding. You are the free one. You're not responsible for freeing other men. You are responsible for freeing you. And leaving God to deal with freeing the men that have to be freed. But you're not responsible for changing people. You are responsible for changing you. Fix you and let God deal with the rest. That works in marriage, that works in business, that works in ministry, that works in career. It works everywhere. You are not called to change people. God will change them himself. Fix you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Praise God. And because of that, because of that, he said, and I will not remember them anymore. Why does he say I will not remember them anymore? He said the same in Hebrews 8, 12. That for I will be merciful and gracious to their sins and I will remember their deeds of unrighteousness no more. Why does God choose to forget sin? Because it is nature to forget sin. And it is good for God to forget sin. Because it is who he is. Now, he said, forgiving of us as God in Christ forgave us. How did God in Christ forgive us? He blotted out and cancelled out all our transgressions. For his own sake and he made a decision not to remember our sin it's the same way you should deal with men blot out cancel transgression remember it no more is it possible for the human being not to remember in the flesh no in the spirit yes hallelujah and when you live in the constant life of salvation you're always in the transaction of trying to take your spirit over the flesh. And as it does, the remembrance comes. Okay, how do I do that? I'll answer you. Someone will hurt you, and then after that hurting, Satan will always create the image of what you forget. But what many Christians forget is that because Satan can bring back that remembrance of that evil deed done to you, it doesn't mean that that deed still exists spiritually. Because you forget. Are you hearing me? And Satan now tries to do stuff to convince you to conceive that stuff such that you create the reality of his existence even when you forget. And when you do, then sin has consumed you, their sin has consumed you, and therefore, even though you say it, you have not really forgiven. To forget actually means to remind yourself always that you forgive. Did you understand that? To remind yourself always that you forgive is to forget. So, what if Satan brings back the image of the sister that hurt you? First thing, I forgive in the mighty name of Jesus. And I tell people that confession is made unto salvation. So you learn to speak it on your life. I forgive my father. I forgive my mother. I forgive. I forgive. I forgive in the name of Jesus. I refuse to look at them badly. I refuse to seek vengeance for them. I refuse to wish bad for them. So if bad befalls them, sad. But I don't wish anything bad for them. I am free. I am ready. I am done. I forgive. The more you continue doing that, every time you remind yourself of forgiveness it means that you are indeed one which has forgotten the sin that is how you know you're forgotten but you know when you get in the conversation and every time you bring back the conversation remember last week let me first take you back remember the first time that means you have not what forgotten when you forgive and forget you never bring but i want to use it for reference don't even use it for reference no, but I was just using it as an example to make a point. You don't need to make a point by digging up the past. But what if the person doesn't understand? Then you should grow in understanding that there are certain people who don't understand. You know, when you were younger, I told people when I was younger, I used to think I could change everyone, I could talk to everyone and change them. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, anybody can change, I believe it. But only by God. And only by the word. So I think if you do this and that and that, they'll understand. If you'll explain yourself this way, they'll surely understand. And as you grow up, you start to realize that there are people 
who will never understand. You can repeat yourself over a same sentence 20 times and the person still doesn't what? Understand. And so as you grow, you learn to sit and say, you know what? You stay with my demons there as long as they don't cross my side. Let God work on you. Are you hearing me? I love you. I forgive you. But stay with my demons. Because every time I come into the space of engaging your demons, I come out with one. Have you ever tried to help someone and by the time you're speaking, you now also start cutting a wire. You're like, bro, why don't you... Oh, 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 oh. So you learn and say, you know what? Stay with your demon. As long as you don't cross my side. If you do, I address them. I release fire. Not on you, but on the demons working on you. But you can stay in your madness. In me, what I'll do is I'll still stay a man of God. I'll forgive you, love you. But uh, stay with your demons. Are you hearing me? Because as you grow, you realize that there are people, it doesn't matter from where you speak from, they will never understand. Are you hearing me? Remember you're dealing with principalities, uh, rulers of darkness, powers, and spirits of wickedness in high places. Spirits of wickedness in high places settle on men. A man can have wickedness on him. Are you hearing me? And if you're dealing with wickedness on a person, no amount of thought, reason, debate, all law can change them because they're just who they are and when you can sense that someone is wicked the best you can do is just leave them to be and just be in peace with them so when the bible says that when a man walks right before god even your enemy shall be at peace with you it doesn't mean that they stop being your enemy remember the bible says they stay your enemies but they have peace with you but they still stay your enemies you know, someone can hate you and do nothing to you. That's all right. Praise God. That's all right. But as you grow, you start to see that, yes, some reconcile, but some never. Some will stay enemies to you for the rest of your life. What are you going to do? And you know, you're also dealing with some folk who can't breathe without being loved. Some of you, you want the whole world to love you. Mama. <laughs> and I feel so sad when you become a preacher. Because some of us, you make one sentence and the whole social media has abused you in 24 hours. Abuses that all of you collected together can never be abused. And I'm a man of God. So, what I'm trying to tell you here is, you're not going to please everyone. You can only walk in love and love everybody. But not everyone will take your love. Not everyone will take your love. God's hand is extended to mankind for salvation. They know he wants them. Some know the truth, but they cannot come to him. Because that's just who they are. Are you hearing me? Somebody shout amen. amen. But he wills that all men come to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But it's for your sake. It's for your advantage. Hallelujah. It's the only way your faith can work. That's my next issue here. But I want to stress that forgiveness activates the full operation of your faith. Galatians chapter 5 verse 6. He says, For if we are in Christ Jesus, if we are in Christ Jesus, he says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith activated and energized and expressed and working through love. Did you hear that? Faith is activated faith is expressed faith is energized faith works through love that means if you walk out of love your faith weakens when you walk out of love your faith what weakens it weakens your faith weakens so you choose do i want to live a full life of faith or do i want to be consumed by unforgiveness A lady left this country years ago and certain things about me, she ran mud and I was told. And a certain pastor started carrying rumors about me concerning the woman's madness. And I know Satan well placed this to bring disrepute to my ministry and my person. 
And so this person runs mad and then she's out of the country and then words are spoken of this person and this pastor gets the information and then starts spreading rumors about me or in fact the mad girl is saying these things and they ran mad. And when I went to pray, my head, the kernel beat of me would have said, aha, uh -huh, let this madness be kept so They can know not to blaspheme or know how to act the right way. But as I was praying for her, the Lord told me this is the time to love that person now when they're against you. Right? The Spirit of the Lord prompted me and he said, pay for the ticket to go and they treat her. And I paid the bill for that ticket. And they treated this person and they were healed. They never called me to say, I'm sorry. I did my part. But after three years, that person calls me back and says, I've called to tell you I'm sorry. After three years, even when they knew what I've done. And I told them, look, I forgave you from that day. Are you hearing me? And I said to them, I hope you find peace and find God because I'm not that man from that time I forgave you a lot has grown on me and in me. My faith did not stall that day. It increased that day because I chose to forgive and do an act of love in the time when somebody had set themselves against me. Another person attacked me once openly, badly. So badly. And as I went in prayer, I said, God, why? Why did they do this? And you know, for me, because I'm a man of God, when I weep over someone, I don't know whether it's five or six or seven years, somehow God deals with them. Vengeance is of the Lord. It's not me. I don't know why or how. I don't know. Maybe they set principles that sort of set them, you know, because I went back and looked through my life and I saw everyone that ever hurt me, you know, and I wept in my heart. Somehow God dealt with them. I don't know how, but he did. So I don't know what's upon me, but it is. I've seen it. I've, I remember even in primary when I just experienced God, you know. A boy came and just kicked me so hard and I fell and got a very bad wound on my leg and I wept in my heart and I said, why did he kick me for nothing? And I was young and then I remember in a vision seeing this fellow coming before and they were putting him before the assembly and they were caning him so heavily for something else. And it was like a vision. I was a little child, about nine. And the next week again, something happened. I don't know even how. I just remember that same vision I'd seen when I was nursing my wound. They put him before the assembly and he had done something and they whooped him for so long. I mean, I remember people I worked with in my former workplace and some of them don't have jobs now. And they crossed me back in those days. So I'm not saying I'm proud of what happens to them. I'm only saying when you touch the Lord's anointed, you be careful. I'm not scaring you, but I'm just telling you the truth. Don't touch God's people. The person you seated to is a woman of God. The man you're seated next to is a man of God. So be very careful when you deal with people who have a covenant with God. Are you hearing me? God knows how to avenge his anointed. He knows. It doesn't matter 10, 20 years, it does. But it's not in the heart of the anointed to seek vengeance. It should not be in the heart of the anointed to seek vengeance. It's God to deal with that because he's God. He knows. He knows how to discipline them. Because also him, he doesn't do it in hatred. No, he does it to get their attention a certain way. He does it in his own way of love. And that's God. So I don't even want to go there. Are you hearing me? So my heart wept. And as I was praying, the Spirit of the Lord told me, you know what? Yes. He told me, go and clear that person's bill. All of it in hospital. I said, what? That? I said, yeah, that one. What? He said, yes, that one. The one, yes. Go, incognito, clear all the bills, and walk away. Okay. So I went, right? And I paid everything, everything they needed. And I walked away. And in my evening prayers, I'm praying, the Lord says, this is why I promote you. This is why. There are things that will come in your life not because you went on a prayer mountain and you're a very prayerful woman. Very prayerful man. 
but it is how you deal with God. He says, whatsoever you do to the least of these, that you do unto me. Some of you, your promotion is in how you treat your enemy. Your next promotion is going to be on how you react to your enemy, to those that hate you. Your promotion is stuck based on the man that hurts you. But you don't know it. You don't know it. A girl came to the office one of those days and says, I want to interview you. My spirit told me, no, there's a problem with this girl. I refused, but somehow somebody managed to convince me against my judgment. And I met this person. And next thing I know, she's taking interviews of me, and she's taking photos of me on the streets. And the next day, tabloid, Fanero sex count. And the newspaper insinuated that the women that were on that office that day that were taking photos of serving, they were all my wives. Are you hearing me? And then parents picked these papers and they had heard that their children are going to Fanero. I received cases of about three kids that were beaten badly by their parents for coming to Fanero. And two of them came with very swollen jaws. One young man came with lines of swelling. Why? Because he was coming to Fanero, a sex cult. I walked streets and I entered shopping malls and parents jeered at me. Some stopped and said, what do you want with our kids? We'll kill you. We'll destroy you. And this young girl took my photo innocently. You understand what I'm saying? And then he went on the internet. And some of our ministries that invite me out of the country read them. Because you have people who move by rumor and not truth. And some ministries could not work with me anymore because we are a sex cult. You enter a banking hall and you sit next to someone and they look at you in anger and walk out. I was invited for a speaking engagement to give a speech to some secondary school students. There were about 2,000 of them. I was going to teach them about life. And a guy sat next to me and he started talking at me, speaking. I'm hearing him. He's saying, cult, devil, devil worshiper, devil, wicked. He's saying all these words at me. He's angry. Why? Because somebody wrote an article. During that same week, I tuned on the radio and a pastor in Kampala who calls himself apostle. I'm yet to, to understand what apostle means because, you know, when you're talking about the apostolic, eh, the apostolic is anointed, it's demonstrative in power, but the apostolic also is patient. Paul says that you have observed my manner of the apostolic. He speaks of the patience of the apostolic. The apostolic office does not rush to judge. The apostolic office is not quick to judge. By the time I stand on the pulpit and speak on something, I'm coming from so far. So far. And this guy is reading line by line of that newspaper. And he's teaching on Christian radio. He's teaching on Christian radio. And he calls himself an apostle. He's teaching. He read that whole page on radio. Religious leaders started getting these pages and reading them in their churches. Our reverend just read the article before us. People read those articles in churches in this nation. Because one girl had a camera. And that was the beginning of many things that have happened. Because one girl had a camera. She went to school to destroy another man's destiny. And I went to pray. And the Lord told me, none of this, none of this shall faze you. It shall turn for your good. It shall turn for your good. But, pray for that young girl. And I remember that time, in the worst time possible, everything they used to do to me, I remember those girls. She had another friend of hers. And I just found myself praying for them. Praying for them. Praying for them. That they might come to the saving knowledge 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Lord told me one day she will come. She will come on her knees and tell me I'm sorry. And I will tell her I forgive you when you had just written that article. But in forgiving this girl, in the heart to want to forgive this girl, he still, still speaks these words and he says, for this reason, I will increase you. For this reason, I will uphold you. For this reason, I will sustain you. For this reason, I will justify you. For this reason, I will vindicate you. For this reason, I will fight for you. And men have met me by the dozens and they just come and say, Apostle, I hated you. Even yesterday I was speaking to one man who said, I had a problem with you. I hated you with my gut. But I love you now. I've had you. I've had the God you speak, the message of grace. It is saving. Are you hearing me? But if I'd let that evil consume me, I would have lost a big number of people. That is why I don't talk back at the men who attack me. I don't attack them on this altar. I don't. I can mention names and bet you I'm a very smart guy. I can construct sentences that can close certain ministries in this nation. But I choose not to. I choose not to. That's what makes us big. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our faith worketh. And just that one act can increase the miraculous in your ministry. That one act can increase wealth and understanding and wisdom and revelation. That one act can change and uphold and bring you to the next level of ministry and life. That simple act of extending forgiveness can change your marriage, your career, your business, your everything that touches you. That simple act of forgiveness. Some of you, you're held. Some pastors, their ministries are held because they can't let go of the stuff their spiritual fathers did to them. Well, let go. Just let go. Just let go. Oh, I'll never do this again for anyone because it's this to me. No, 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 no. Don't cut your hands short. Your love for men because somebody hurt you. Oh, I'll never help this. I'll never do this for people because one person spoiled the road. No. Help the next. Why? Because it's in your nature. It's in your character. It's in who you are. It's what makes you a woman of God. It's expressed by love. It works through love. If you go out of the love walk, you're gone. Somebody shout amen. And so you say, how many times should I forgive? <laughs> Matthew 18, 21. He says, then Peter came unto him and said, Lord, how many times may my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let go? As many as up to seven times. He's trying to say, can I do seven? Can I do seven, please? And you know, many Christians use reference of the life before the death and resurrection of Christ, the bringing of life and regeneration and the new birth. Many of them claim the life and walk and live in the life of men which are unregenerated and born again yet they are born again the disciples here speaking to Jesus were not yet born again do you know that that's why somewhere in Luke he tells them you know that you have to forgive him that has transgressed you and the disciples tell Jesus increase our faith you understand because they didn't have that kind of faith beginning from verses 4 he says, if he trespass against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, he says, you shall forgive that individual. Now we are still talking about the seven times. Okay? And the disciples tell Jesus in the next verse, the apostles, they said, increase our faith. Because how? They were not yet changed, fully changed. Increase our faith. You have that measure of faith. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so, Peter is speaking here. Oh, now let's discuss this measure, this thing. Is it seven times? And then Jesus said, uh-uh. I tell you, not up to seven times, but 70 times seven. That is in a day. 490 times. Some of you, you snap on one. They just cross you on one. I told people once, nobody can make you angry. No. 
if you're angry, it's because they've done something that brings the anger out of you, which was already inside. No man can make you angry. No, but they can bring the anger which is inside. So some of you, you're just in positions of being tested. The anger was there, but there was no atmosphere to provoke it. And then you meet a very provocative individual with Nephilim, wickedness, hubris, everything. And then they mix you up. Eh? And then you say, this person makes me. No, they don't make you. You are angry. It's there. They just touch it. They just do something that what? Pricks it and then it comes out. <laughs> Hallelujah, somebody. So Jesus says, no, it's 70 times, 7 times. Woo! Yes, that's the many times. Hallelujah. But you see here, God was dealing with man's impatience to forgive. The, I, the first time you did it, I forgave you. The second time, I forgave you. The third time, I forgave you. The fourth time, I forgave you. Fifth time? Fifth time? Fifth time? And God says, no. 490. Count them every day. And every day, the mass is new. So when you cross over to the next day, we begin with one again. You don't bring back yesterday's Some are increase our faith. For us, we are, we got this. It's in us. It's in our nature. It's in our DNA. We are ready and free enough to let men go. Somebody shout hallelujah. And a similar test comes in the church of Corinth. In 1 Corinthians, they speak of a man which committed incest to his father's wife. And he said, this kind of fornication, it was so bad. He said, that one is not even among the Gentiles. You understand? Things like incest. He said, this one, even the Gentiles know that you can't sleep with your child or your sister or your father's wife. And now here we see a fellow who is doing that. And then, you know, the anger comes, the uproar, the judgment comes through. Because, you know, when you read the Pauline series, you also see years of Paul growing. Some people don't know that the letters of Paul also show his progressive life of growth. He was not there the first day. And so, yes, they judged this man, of course, it was wrong. And some people think that in forgiving and all that, we overlook the fact that sin is so and that it is bad. No, me forgiving you doesn't mean that what you've done is right or that it's light. It's heavy. I'm just doing it after the nature of God, but your bad is bad. Sin is sin and evil is evil. Wickedness is wicked. Okay? So, yes, they bring this guy out. They pronounce anathema on him and the story is given that he falls sick and he's almost to death, but we start to see an ounce of repentance on his heart. We start to see him trying to make that right, but there was never a space of bringing this guy back because he had already screwed up, and that's when religion takes in and says, look, you messed up once, you eat forever. And so Paul comes back in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5, and he says, if someone, the one among you who committed incest, has caused all this grief and pain, uh, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure not to put it too severely he has distressed you all okay it's not to one man but it's to all and says for such a one is this censure by the majority which he has received is sufficient punishment so instead of father rebuke now you should rather turn and graciously forgive and comfort and encourage him to keep him from being overwhelmed by excessive sorrow and despair he says i therefore beg you to reinstate him in your affections and assure him of your love for him for this was my purpose in writing to you to test your attitude to see if you stand the test whether you are obedient and all together agreeable to following my orders in everything in everything okay the guy screwed up but the guy is showing signs of repentance let's see whether you're going to bring him back or you're going to still stay that's why i hate the spirit of religion if there's something i struggle with in unforgiveness i struggle in unforgiveness for religion and spirit so pray for me i hate it i detest it because unforgiveness will get you doing something in 1992 and from that day on it doesn't matter how much change takes place in your life for it it sticks on the date of 1992 it still sees you like one who is just going to do it afresh but in 1992 God, I hate religion even the smell of it asks me I love it 
when I sit around religious people, I start feeling like something is oh. I hate religion, not people, but I hate religion because religion does not forget. And some of you are religious. Are you hearing me? So Paul is saying, yes, this guy is sorry. Again, there are people who you can forgive and they stay adamant and proud. Leave them in their space. Are you hearing me? Because we can resolve to have peace. But I leave you in your space if you're just adamant and funny and leave you with your demons. But they mean that I have anger with you. You understand what I'm saying? People can be like that and you leave them in their space and adamant in their own space. You understand? Not for marriage though. <laughs> for marriage you're one. You understand? For marriage you're what? So you can't leave. How? You're one. Can you cut yourself off? You can't. But anyway, if somebody shows a sign of, I'm trying to work this out, okay? The Bible says, extend your hand and reach out and love them. Confirm and affirm your love toward them. He says, go out and, with other time, graciously forgive, comfort, and encourage. You know what encouraging means? You know, yes, I know you screwed up, but God still has plans for your life. He will use you. This is not your end. Eh? You can still move on. That's the encouraging. But some of you, even in forgiveness, you still tell him. I tell something, uh, no, please. That's not how God has called us. And I tell people, even as Christians, when we see people and they're working out a place of repentance, okay, some of you stay still angry and you... No. The moment someone turns and they show you that they're sorry, they're working out to be sorry, run straight. Why? Because if they get overwhelmed with guilt and commit suicide or destroy themselves or walk out of the faith before God, you are responsible because you let them go into an excessive sorrow and despair. Now, as God says, it doesn't matter how bad a man has done, it's not our job to make people feel bad when they're already feeling bad about themselves. You know, we have people who add more salt to the injury. Hey! assure him he has it to know she has it to know hey, hey, don't press it in we know come on some people are just like that they know how to press in a man who's already wounded the man is down he's bleeding he's trying to get up and then they even add in the wound he even did this she even did this ah <laughs> uh -uh, that's not the christian faith he said we are not supposed to let men go into excessive sorrow and despair because of their weaknesses when we see that they're working out to come back Restore them, love them, encourage them, reinstate them with your love and tell them, look, we love you. Show them your affection and tell them, look, you're still one of us. And once they're clean and they're walking right, act like with them like nothing ever happened. And if you ever meet someone who brings back that story and you know the man is restored, tell him I don't know who you're talking about. The man I have in my life, the friend I have in my life, I don't know them like that. But you have forgotten, no, 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 no. I don't know because we forgive to forget so how are you bringing back that narrative Do you understand what I'm saying you cannot be found speaking about someone when you're walking in forgiveness forgiveness means you don't even talk about it the stuff we just don't talk about it just don't talk about it. back in the day in Africa those things were culture now they're dying out as people are getting more secular and more wildly and connecting with other cultures across in the African culture there are things people never even used to speak women used to have children from other men and a man gets to know it and he never tells the child they never even tell anyone some kids just discover later when they're old eh? used to keep those things yeah someone did this yes but it's not for us to talk you could not get it out of an Africa. but now social media the women go on facebook and type men go on facebook and type you report each other the things you did together you're now putting them on social media but you made the decision to do those things the two of you why are you stressing the world when you're not you know that thing beats me eh? You enter a relationship with a man and you know it. You were sober. You do your man things there. You were sober. 
then the guy just becomes the frog he was originally. You didn't know. And then you go on social media. I'm going to expose him. Mama, mama, mama. Who entered the relationship again? Sorry? Own up. And say, get a dirty frog. Now I'm going to look for another good man and move on. Just move on. Just move on. And the same applies to men too. You come out of a relationship and then you talk about someone for 20 years. That woman is. Hey, 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 hey. One time there was a guy who had the border border. Was it a border border? I think. And then behind the border border he said, What would I earn there at Chewankora? Directly translated, Angela, whatever you did to me, what is wrong with people? Why would I Angela say one corner? On a Buddha Buddha. Ha ha. Angela, I'm correct. Let it go. Move on. Tell the neighbor, move on. Move on. Hallelujah. Yeah. Nobody's responsible for your future. No. You can reconstruct it from there. And move on. Somebody shout hallelujah. You can reconstruct it from there and do what? And move on. Second last. We speak of this because it's the only way you can maintain a healthy life of prayer. Healthy life of prayer. Mark 11, 23. He said, truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and be thrown in the sea, and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that which he says will take place, it shall be done. Praise God. Faith. Hallelujah. Yeah? And for this reason, he says, I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it shall be granted to you and you will get it. And then some people end on 24 and they say, now we're going to ask. No, no. 25 says, and whenever, whenever, he didn't say sometimes or remember, he said, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop, leave it and let it go. Whenever you do that. Whenever. And so some of you think you can skip verses 25 and end on 24 and have your miracle. No, no, no. It doesn't work that way. You see, for me, God has helped me in a way that if I find myself struggling in prayer, I examine myself against the love walk. Some of you say, pray for me, Apostle, these days. I'm struggling in prayer. Examine yourself in the love walk you will see that many times you've walked out of love. Not all, but many times you've walked out of love. And probably the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you, look, don't go into asking for the deep stuff. We still have unfinished business here. Let's finish this business fast. Whenever you stand, you know, these things seem simple, but they are deep. Because you see, I have seen people who have lived this life of salvation and for years and they don't have results. And these are the things that are killing you. And something, uh, I think I need 70 days of prayer. Put them, 100 days first. You just come more dry with the worst attitude than you went in. Because God still has something to deal with you here. He says, whenever you stand praying, if you have any issue, but if anyone forgive, let it drop, leave it, let it go. When you have the peace that you release someone, now ask for whatsoever you will. You understand what I'm saying? And he says, and it shall be done to you. That's the mystery. That's the principle. Because this faith you're talking about for whatsoever, walketh by love. Hallelujah. And the last one, golden. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12. He says, not that I have now attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of grasp and make my own that which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me and made me his own. He says, I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet, but one thing I do, it is my one aspiration, my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us. And says, so let us, those of us who are spiritually mature and full grown, have this mind and hold these convictions. We must have this mind and hold these convictions. And Paul is saying, 
that I do this one thing, my one aspiration, my one commitment, the one thing that I do. Give me the message of that, verse 13. He says, friends, don't get me wrong, but by no means do I count myself an expert in all things, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is calling us onward, 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 not backward. That is why in the Amplified he says, I don't look back, I always move forward, I look forward, I forget what lies behind. He's telling you here that close your history too. Forgive yourself of your past too. Because sometimes we teach forgiving others and we don't teach about forgiving ourselves. Forget what is backward. Yes, you messed up in 2000. Yeah, you even wish you could. Oh, what were you thinking? You know, there are those moments of, I call them the what was I thinking moment. Ah, uh -uh, don't be so holy. Uh -huh, uh -huh, those ones. Where you go back and say, but. Very good. What was I thinking? You understand what I'm saying? And God says, look, go there, close it. Don't look back again. In other words, as you forgive others, forgive yourself also. Some people forgive everybody except themselves. And if you do not forgive yourself, you short circuit the operation of the glory and power and the faith of God on your life because you'll find yourself unworthy and weigh yourself insufficient for God's sufficiency. You understand what I'm saying? So yes, some of us forgive others. We are free to forgive each other and forgive the rest, but we don't forgive ourselves. And some of you have already determined the kind of future you think you deserve because of the past that you have made. No, listen, even with the worst case of history, you can begin now and bright your future to the end. You can't. Yes. Of course, religion never does. Legal people don't. That's why I hate when people start talking about David's issue with the rear. Oh, now, you see when David... But he stayed with a knock. Yes, he was a man after God's own heart, but he had a knock. Look at this fool. Why are you on the knock? Why are you sitting on the knock? Goliath is here, but you're sitting on the knock. The prince of God is returned back to Israel, but you're sitting on the knock. The man wants to build God a temple, but you are on the and those guys don't leave any story. Leave David alone. Leave the man of God alone. Leave my man. That's our hero. That's a biblical hero. Because how dare you? You know, some people don't understand the working of God. Okay, David messed up. Big deal. Yes. Have you touched the world even to a, a fraction of what David did? And do you think he did that by surprise, like he shocked heaven and got to do the baby, now could you do this? He knew it was coming. But even in the madness of the man, he still says, this is the one I want. Oh, glory to God. He says, this is the one I want. I fear when a man is crazy and God still loves him. I examine myself. I just examine myself. Why is the man crazy and God still loves him? What's wrong with me? It means my heart is somewhere. Because you can be straight here, but you're so broken the other side. You understand what I'm saying? So I don't like those lines. I don't like, but, but, take it. I don't, I, don't, I don't like. In fact, if I was writing David's story, I would not have written it. But I'm not the one who wrote it. You understand? You understand? Why? Because I see the end of God's love even in the most fallen state of that man. And I see God restore him. And he serves God in his generation and dies a very, 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 very different man. But even in his deathbed, when they bring a kagal, he can't feel it. You understand? That kind of change. So there are people who just love the worst lines of people. That one is this bad. This. But there are people who love those but but she this also but she this also but she does this also but he does come on treasures are in earthen vessels God is still working be patient with people they'll finish well and the most amazing thing is judging someone and then you fall into a worse sin are you hearing me but even there he says forgive yourself a lady walked to me and said I've slept with 24 men in one year 
So I've given up on the hope of marriage and what. Just help me go to restore and, and I'll move on well. And I told her, no, darling, God can get that stuff out of you and give you a good man. Hmm? Yes. I told her, I'm going to pray for you, but are you ready to forgive yourself? She went through a process, forgave herself, and God got her a good man. The guy said, whether you've had 20, 200 in the past, that's your story. My story begins now, and the Lord told me you. I said, yeah, this is God. This is what? This is God. Now she's happy. Another lady came in my office, and she had, had three miscarriages, and said, I've lost three children. And when I stretched my hands to pray for her, the Spirit tells me she aborted at the age of 15. And I said, did you abort at the age of 15? She said, yes. Oh, and from then on, I know this is why God is punishing me. Would you talk to him to give me his mercy, to forgive me? And I told her, this is the very reason why you fail to have children. I told her, you fail to have children because you're bringing to remembrance what God does not remember. And every time you bring it to remembrance, you create its reality and the judgment that comes with it. And I told her, if you don't forgive yourself, your womb will never push life. She went through a process of forgiveness. That very year, she had a child, and since then she has had children. What was the difference? Satan has a way of getting into our heads and picking up our past. And when he does, it makes us feel so guilty and thereby put us in bondage. Because he knows, yes, you can forgive others, but you might not know how to forgive yourself. And though I charge you by God, forgive yourself. So what happens when the devil brings the images? Tell him, devil, those are your images. The story and reality of that was taken long ago. I don't know it. The person you're showing me is not me. Oh, that's not me. I'm a new creation in Christ. All things are passed away and now I'm new. And all things are of God. They are of God. That means if there are visions, I have to see them in God, not in your judgment. And if you do that, you're free. So forgive yourself. Get to your feet. Now, I want you to just take a minute. There are people here. I know. You've been struggling with unforgiveness. The freedom to forgive. The readiness to forgive. Not only your fellow man, but of self. I want you to raise your heart to God. And tell him to heal me. Tell him to heal me. Because without forgiveness, love is not complete. Now I just want you to raise your voice and just talk to God.
By the power of the living God, you let go. You forgive. You let it pass. You never talk about it another day. If you are, you just remember this sermon and not talk about it. And that you can begin from then, God can fulfill your life. And even as you are forgiving, that you will be forgiven in the mighty name of Jesus, that you forgive yourself and be patient with men. In Jesus' name we have prayed and believed. Give the Lord a miracle of praise. Come on, clap your hands to Jesus. I am free to forgive. I am free to forgive. And I am ready to forgive. That is who I am in God. And what he has done for me in Christ. Somebody shout Amen. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, I can never tell you how much he forgave your sin. But the Bible says for a while we were yet seen as Christ died. It's against this love that he loved you while you were still a sinner. That today he gives you life. He has sustained you to this age to give you the opportunity this afternoon. And so if you're there and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, repeat this words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you and your word. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. I believe that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory and born again amen the message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International for more information contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at Compala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.